Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming along to this uh, bonus lecture series. I'm very impressed that so many of you have turned up at 9.30 on a, on a Friday morning in the, in the middle of term. So uh, thank you for coming. So this is a, a four-part lecture series, um, which is, uh, as it's been now been given away, titled Philosophical Issues Related to Maximizing Happiness. This could alternatively have been called Philosophical I Issues uh, Related to Effective Altruism, and you'll see there's going to be a number of, of crossovers there. Um, so uh, here's the structure of, uh, of the course. So there's uh, four lectures. So today we're going to cover happiness, what is it, why does it matter, and how can it be measured. We'll be looking at the relationship between happiness and a related uh, and often confused concept called well-being. I'll be explaining why happiness is going to be a part of morality, whatever story of morality you want to tell. And then I'll... Uh, and then we'll move from ethics to philosophy of, uh, of science and look at how happiness uh, can be measured. And I'll say that it, that it can, but there are uh, some doubts remain. The, uh, the, in the second lecture, I'll be looking at the value of saving lives. And so this is uh, uh, one consideration with, uh, we, we have when we're considering maximizing happiness is whether we're going to improve lives, increase the happiness of people during their lives, or save lives. And lecture two is going to preempt uh, the criticism that we should be saving lives, and I'll look at various issues related to that, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sort of question whether anyone should think saving lives is the most good they can do. Uh, lecture three, uh, we look at uh, the sort of the, the current thinking by effective altruist philosophers, such as Singer and McCaskill, who seem to argue that if we're going to improve lives of people alive today, the most effective thing to do is to, is to give to charities which alleviate poverty. And I'm going to say that on the basis of the, the empirical evidence that that's probably not the case. I'll make some further suggestions as to how we might think about improving happiness. And then lecture four takes us to population ethics. Should we be focusing on, on existential risks instead? Another concern if we're interested in maximizing happiness is whether we should be trying to save humanity rather than just save lives or improve lives. And I'll, uh, and, and I'll be arguing roughly that we should just be interested in, in uh, people who are going to exist anyway. So that's the structure of the course. Uh, I should say that these are being, uh, uh, in case it's of relevance to anyone, that these are uh, being recorded. Okay, so let's start by what is happiness. Obviously, this is a tough question, and tough questions are questions we, we ask Google. So happiness is a warm gun, a choice, a state of mind. Happiness is quotes. Happiness is a warm gun lyric. I assume there's some pop reference of which I'm ju just totally unaware. Um, so, I mean, none of those seem particularly illuminating as to what happiness is. Happiness is a state of mind. That, maybe that's, that's telling us something. So the, an important first step when we ask what is happiness is just to get clear on what are the sort of things we're talking about. And there are really two distinct philosophical literatures, each of which aim at asking a slightly different version of the question. So one version of the question is um, what sort of thing... Uh, what sort of life is ultimately good for a person? And the other question could be about the nature of some particular psychological state. So philosophers conventionally use the term well-being to refer to uh, A. So well-being so well is what ultimately makes your life go well for you. And I'm going to use the word happiness to refer to some, some psychological state that we're interested in, the details of which I'll, I'll, specify, uh, I'll specify later on. But in ordinary language, when people ask what is happiness, they could be asking really either one of those questions. And indeed, a third question which someone might be asking is, what are the sources of, uh, of happiness, where happiness can be understood either as I've taken it as well-being or as, uh, as happiness as a psychological state. So the next question which arises is how happiness, the psychological state, fits in with well-being. What is the relationship between, between some of these pleasant states and then, uh, what, uh, uh, and then uh, the life going well for someone? So the, um, uh, there are three accounts of well-being. The first is hedonism, so well-being consists in happiness, where happiness is the positive balance of, uh, of pleasure over pain. So your life goes well when you feel you feel good and your life goes best when you feel as good as possible. The second is preference satisfactionism, sometimes known as, uh, as, as desire theories. Well-being consists in the world going as one wants. And the difference between 
hedonism and preference, uh, pre preference satisfactionism is that on the latter, it's about the world according to your desires rather than about you uh, believing that the world is, uh, is going as you want it to or you feeling satisfied. So let's say you had a preference for there to be cheese on the moon and there was cheese on the moon on preference satisfactionism, your life would be going better, your desires would be being satisfied, the world would be as you want it to be, but you wouldn't be any happier. So depending upon which theory of well-being you prefer, this, this, there being cheese on the moon will either be good for you or not. And the third option is the objective list. So well-being does not consist merely in happiness or preference satisfaction, although it may consist in, in those things, but it consists in other objective goods. And there are a number of ways of constructing the objective list. Um, so, uh, items which we might additionally include on here are loving relationships, meaningful knowledge, autonomy, and achievement. But, but the list is, uh, uh, the, the list is, is up to the um, uh, proponents of the objective list will need to say which items are, are on the list and explain why they're there. And in some sense, uh, all theories of well-being are a list. They're just, there's a sort of what does well-being consist in, and then you've got items on your list. Hedonism says happiness. Preference satisfactionism says satisfied desires. So those two are subjective theories of well-being in some sense. It's, it's relating to how the work, uh, ha, um, is, is to the relationship between, there's a relationship between well-being and what you think or feel. And the objective list holds that your life can go better um, in these objective ways without you wanting those things to happen or you uh, enjoying that they do happen. So Bentham is a famous proponent of, of hedonism. Uh, preference satisfactionism is, uh, is very common, is very commonly used uh, in economics where it's, um, uh, an, an economist will sometimes use the word utility to refer to either satisfied desires or, or happiness. Um, proponents of the objective list, most famous would be Aristotle, but there are other more recent uh, more recent advocates. Um, popular at the moment is the capabilities approach, which is not entirely a theory of well-being, but it's not sort of important for our purposes, and advocates of this would be uh, Marcia Sen and Martha Nussbaum. Right, so those are our th three theories of, of, uh, of well-being. Um, so what is, what is happiness as a psychological state? So uh, Jeremy Bentham said that nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do. So this is the, the classic statement of, of hedonism. Now it's worth distinguishing psychological hedonism from evaluative hedonism. So psychological hedonism is the view that the, that the only reason we ever do things is to uh, bring about pleasure or to avoid pain. And so this is a, a psych you know, this is a descriptive account of how we act. And then there's evaluative hedonism, which is, which is the claim that, that um, pleasure and pain are the only things which are respectively good or bad for us. So Bentham is advocating for evaluative hedonism. He's not just saying we chase after pleasure and run away from pain, but actually those are the things which are, are good or bad for us. And Bentham has a, a, a very uh, simple account of uh, of happiness, so there are just two properties which are, which are of interest, so there's duration and intensity. And if we wanted to represent uh, someone's well-being over, over the course of their life, we could do so on a graph. On the x-axis, we would just look at time. On the y-axis, we could plot their, their intensi the intensity of their experience at any given point. And the total well-being that person would have, um, according to Bentham, would just be the area under the line. So. We're imagining there's also some neutral point on the graph which is equal to death or perhaps equal sort of hedonically neutral, feels neither good nor bad, and the value of your life is just the area, or just be the area above that line. So that's that's not the the uh, only account of it's not the only account of happiness, and I think it uh, I'm I think I'm probably obliged to mention Mill's higher and lower pleasures. So as I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you will, will know, uh, John Stuart Mill was responding to the criticism that hedonism, as advocated by Bentham, was the philosophy of swine, that it didn't distinguish between certain kinds of, um, certain kinds of states which seemed valuable, um, 
and uh, so states of kind of high intellectual, uh, high intellectual uh, uh, effort and endeavor and, and, and perception uh, from kind of the, the more like the, the sort of the functioning of the lower, fa lower faculties. So Mill responded to, to this by, talk, by making a distinction between higher and lower pleasures. So the idea is that there, is, that there are some pleasures f um, and the, the tip ones which are typically mentioned are things like engagement in philosophy or participation in art, which are um, higher in comparison to the others. And, uh, uh, and the thought is that, though, that, um, that, sort of, that, that individuals will be prepared to exchange any amount of a lower pleasure, whatever exactly these things are, for a higher pleasure. So when Bent Bentham's account was um, monistic, there's just one thing in, in happiness, which is its intensity. Mill uh, argues that there's a distinction of higher and higher and lower pleasures. So for, um, I don't want to spend uh, 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 very much time on this, although um, as with everything else, I'm prepared to pick it up in, in questions. Um, so just, I should say that the, hour, that the lecture will be about an hour and then we've got half an hour questions for those who want to stick around. So the uh, the challenge with uh, with Mill's view is that it's it, it seems to uh, it seems to abandon is it seems to abandon hedonism proper. So what do I mean by that? If you ask a uh, so a hedonist will will be a sort of a, a, a hedonism proper will uh, involve two answers to two different questions. So the first is substantive hedonism. So we ask the question, what does well-being consist in? And the answer is the greatest balance of pleasure uh, over pain. Over pain. And then there's explanatory hedonism. So the question, what makes pleasure good and pain bad? And the answer, the explanation is that the pleasantness of the pleasure and the painfulness of the pain. So the challenge for Mill is that he seems to abandon explanatory hedonism. So the value of higher pleasures can't just be their pleasantness, because that's exactly the distinction he's tried to make, that there's a value over and above the intensity of the pleasures. There's some distinction between the ones which are higher and lower, which is not just about their intensity. So, so maybe that uh, it may be that that, um, uh, that Mill is correct in this. I don't think he is, but it, but in some sense, Mill is giving up on Mill is giving up on on hedonism. So, um, uh, moving on, I think a, a terminological suggestion uh, when we talk about happiness is that I uh, I prefer the phrase uh, following Crisp that happiness is a positive balance of enjoyment over suffering, rather than pleasure over pain. And I think the, uh, uh, the, the, reason for, the reason for this move is that when we think about pleasure and pain, these are, these are very kind of bodily sensations, whereas enjoyment and suffering can seem to encompass various kind of cognitive, um, cognitive ones as well. So I think if, if Bentham had talked about the things which were valuable were enjoyment, was that uh, the good life was one which had the greatest balance of enjoyment over suffering, he would be less open to the kind of philosophy, less immediately open to the philosophy of swine criticism that um, Carlyle put forward and that Mill responded to. So I think when we talk about happiness, we should be encompassing all kinds of, uh, all kinds of psychological states. Um, and the, the ones we, and, and a state of happiness is just one where the, the, the enjoyable ones uh, are stronger than the, than, the, than the unenjoyable or the suffering ones. OK, so that was uh, part one, a uh, short was around um, happiness and, and well-being and the relationship between them. Now, one thing I, uh, I haven't said but which I could potentially have said is, uh, is talked about which theory, which theory of well-being is true. I'm prepared to talk about it at the end if, if people are interested, but actually um, it's not important for our purposes, to, to, which is to show that happiness matters, to, uh, to be hedonists, and I'll explain why. So there's two steps to this. So all plausible, um, all plausible moral views will hold that increasing happiness is, in practice, good. Okay, so everyone agrees that well-being matters, but there's a debate as to whether well-being is the only thing that matters. So there's a, uh, a view called welfareism, is the view that well-being is the only thing that matters, matters morally. So other kinds of goods which we might think of important, such as freedom, justice, rights, these are only instrumentally good. These are only good in as much as they as they as they bring about in the end an increase in an increase in welfare. So while not everyone is a welfareist, um, everyone will accept 
everyone with a, a plausible moral view, I suggest, will accept that well-being is just one, it's going to be one part of the story of morality. It's going to be a, a pretty big part. So everyone will think that, that, that uh, well-being uh, matters, um, and all theories of well-being have some role for happiness within it. So if you're a hedonist, then well-being consists only in happiness, so it's fairly easy to see why happiness is going to be part of the story. On a desire satisfactionism, this view places no intrinsic value on happiness. If it, if it did, it would be uh, a different kind of view. But if we assume that in most cases people will want to, one of the things people desire will, uh, will be to be happier, then desire satisfactionists will think will be, you know, in most cases, will think that increasing happiness is good. If you can increase happiness but not meet anyone's, not meet anyone's desires, then they will think there is uh, they'll think that's not good for the person, but there are only there's not going to be that many cases where where these things really come apart. And then on the objective list, depending upon the list you construct, happiness is going to be either instrumentally good because, let's say, preferences are on the list and happiness uh, and, and being happier is uh, contributes to the satisfaction of your preferences, or one of the items on your on your objective list uh, is happiness. So um, there's no getting away. There's no getting away from happiness. Okay, so everyone agrees welfare is part of the story and happiness is going to be part of, this, part of welfare. Um, and also, I think all plausible ethical theories will accept we have a pro-tanto reason to promote the good. So this is a quote from uh, John Rawls, um, not himself a, a consequentialist. He said that all ethical theories worth our attention must take consequences into account when judging rightness. One which did not would simply be irrational, crazy. So there are, there are some uh, consequentialists who think when deter the rightness of an action, what we uh, ought to do or are required to do or is permissible is just determined by how much good is out there. And the, the, kind of the, or the obvious version of this view is utilitarianism, which holds the right action is the one that in expectation promotes the greatest amount of, of happiness. But even if you take a non-consequential view, you don't think that rightness is just determined by goodness, you will still think goodness matters some of the time. We have a pro-tanto reason to promote the good. What do I mean by pro-tanto? A bit of jargon. So a pro-tanto reason is just one which has moral weight, but it can be outweighed by more reasons. So if you have a pro-tanto reason, you do have a reason to do something, but it might not be a decisive and all, all things considered reason. So, um, why might our pro-tanto reason to, to bring about the good um, not be what we ought to do? So there might be uh, constraints to our action. So uh, lots of people believe that you should not kill one to save five. So presumably killing the one to save the five is going to lead to a greater total amount of, uh, of, of goodness, if we're going to define goodness. But that we might think that uh, morality imposes certain constraints on our actions. So even though it would be better in terms of the value of states of affairs to kill a one to save the five, yeah, they're right, yeah, to kill a one to save the five, it would still be wrong to do so because we're violating a constraint. Okay, but then absent constraints, we should be promoting the good. So the other thing which might get in the way are prerogatives. So doing good might be um, supererogatory. So supererogatory means that something is not required, it's sort of beyond the call of duty. And uh, an example here that uh, might be sacrificing oneself to save five others. So sacrificing oneself to save five others would, uh, let's assume, be good. It would you know, increase the total value of states of affairs, but you're not required to do so. And why are you not required to do so? Because you have a, a, a personal prerogative. You can give more weight to your, your own interests, your own well-being, uh, than to others. So even though it would be good for you to do so, you're not obliged to do so. But then absent these things, it seems like we ought to be promoting the good. So uh, Peter Singer's famous example is that if we were walking past a pond and we would see a, see a drowning child and we, would, um, and we could rescue this child by jumping in to get our clothes um, uh, and, get, and jumping in would get our clothes uh, wet and, and ruin our suit, then we ought to do so. Um, so even though this would be a cost to us, the cost to us is morally, sufficiently morally small. Most people will think that we nevertheless ought to do so. So maybe you are not required to sacrifice yourself to save five others, but maybe you would be re required to sacrifice yourself to save a billion or a trillion others. 
So it's a question of how demanding morality is, and that's not a question I'm interested in dealing with here, but um, uh, I think it's, it would be widely accepted that we should be doing, that we should be prepared to do good um, at some cost to ourselves, or at least when it's very easy. And in those situations, we should be promoting the good. So where does that get us? We have a reason to promote the good. Um, a part of the good is welfare, and part of welfare is, is happiness. So we all have we all have a pro tanto reason to be bringing about happiness. Okay, so that's the yeah that's the argument for why everyone should be at least a little bit interested in understanding how we can how we can bring about more happiness, and not just for our own sake but for for others. Um, and those are uh, kind of ethical questions we've been we've been looking at all questions related to value as well. Um, and now we turn to philosophy of science. So do we think happiness can be, do we think happiness can be measured? So um, you may see, uh, uh, you may often see in the news uh, sort of studies saying things like uh, Denmark is the happiest country in the world or Costa Rica is the happiest country or, or in Norway is the happiest country. And um, so what will be happening in, in this case is that a bunch of people will have been polled um, on some survey and they will, these surveys will be compared around the world and that's, uh, and that's how, how, it's, how it's determined. So, um, the, but there are, there are sort of some, some confusions here um, relating to the fact that it's not, uh, that there's a, um, the, the relationship between what uh, social scientists call subjective well-being and what I've termed happiness can be um, kind of the, the muddies can be can be watered by the the way people use the the word. So, so social scientists tend to talk about measuring subjective well-being, and they sometimes call subject and they sometimes say subjective well-being is the same thing as happiness. But I'll as I'll show in the in a moment that's um, somewhat unhelpful and it's not technically correct to say that subjective well-being is the same thing as happiness. Okay, so what do, um, what do, when social scientists talk about subjective well-being, what do they mean? So Dolan and Metcalf, two social scientists, say that measures of subjective well-being are ratings of thoughts and feelings about life. And subjective well-being is typically thought to have three components. First is evaluative, sometimes known as cognitive, which is a reflective assessment of a person's life or some specific part of it. An experience component, sometimes known as affect, uh, affect or affective. So, affect is um, it's kind of a psychologist a psychologist term for for emotion, or uh, or hedonic, and these are a person's emotional states, typically measured with reference to a point in time. And then we have uh, the eudaimonic component, so a sense of meaning or purpose in life, or psychological functioning. Now, it can be a little bit hard to understand really what's going on here until we see how these things are measured. So here, are, here are some examples. So um, on the left, we have a left. We have a, this is an experiential measure. So, uh, so uh, you might have an app which pings you and asks you how you're feeling right now. So this would be called the experience sampling method, and it's sort of seen as the gold standard for collecting data on people's experiences. And then you, you kind of can plot these. Uh, you can plot these over time. Um, there are there are um, other methods. So another um, slightly less uh, cumbersome one is the day reconstruction method where you will ask someone what they did yesterday to break it down into a number of sort of sessions a bit like sections a bit like scenes in a movie and then give each one a rating and then you'll you'll take the you'll look at the uh, duration the intensity weighted um, value of the of the day so that's the kind of the experience measure um, the most common question which is asked is, are, are, uh, is, is life satisfaction, which is how satisfied are you with your life nowadays, zero to 10, so 10 not at all, 10 completely satisfied. And so if you, if you go on the BBC and it says, uh, Denmark is the happiest country in the world, usually, what, usually this has been a life satisfaction measure. So they'll be asked, how satisfied are you? And, that's, and, they, and life satisfaction is interpreted as happiness, um, which I'll, say in a moment I think is, is it's somewhat unhelpful. Uh, and the third type is, is eudaimonic. So what extent do you feel things in your life are worthwhile? So I've put eudaimonic in, in scare quotes. Uh, eudaimonic is 
uh, is a Greek term for flourishing and is associated with Aristotle's idea of, of well-being. The good life is the flourishing life. Um, but it's somewhat unclear that Aristotle would have thought that asking someone to what extent do you feel things in your life are worthwhile would really have captured what he thought um, the good life was. So anyway, but this is, this is how the term is, is, used, uh, is used in modern social psychology. So if we're asking ourselves which of these three measures, the evaluative, the experiential, the eudaimonic, what's the relationship between these and happiness? Well, I, I hope it's clear that the experience measure is the, is the only one which is a direct measure of happiness. So if, we want to, if we're just interested in happiness um, and we could, you know, we could find out how someone felt at every point in time, uh, then that would tell us everything we wanted to know uh, according to Bentham about how, um, how happy someone was. So subjective well-being has three components, and one of those is, is kind of a direct measure of happiness, and the other two are slightly different things. So this isn't to say necessarily that this isn't necessarily to say that the other measures aren't useful in trying to uh, increase our understanding of uh, uh, to increase our understanding of happiness. So I think that the um, so there isn't not very much data has been collected using eudaimonic measures. So I'm really just going to talk about evaluative measures, i.e. life satisfaction, and then uh, experience measures. Um, but we might think that, but, but, but I think w we can and we should um, use life satisfaction as a proxy for, for happiness. So, so the reason for this is that, is the reason for this is that, um, is that there isn't very much data on the use of experience measures either. So it's much harder to collect lots of information about people's day-to-day -day lives than it is to occasionally um, get someone in a survey to ask how are you feeling about your life as a whole and so because it's much harder and more expensive there's just much more data of the in the form of life satisfaction so if we're interested in trying to answer the the important practical question of what maximizes happiness to the best of my knowledge there just isn't enough experience data to really look through those to, to really try and answer those questions whereas I think we we can make some progress using life satisfaction as our as our proxy measure um, so the two do give uh, the two do give uh, somewhat different results. So um, education is uncorrelated with experience, but it is correlated with life satisfaction. Um, the education between uh, life satisfaction and um, an income is pretty good. So it's always it's always better to be richer. But there's a sort of diminishing relationship between um, between experience measures and um, uh, uh, experience measures and uh, an income. People are people report higher um, higher happiness on weekends. So if you depending upon where you, when you poll them, but if you ask people about their life satisfaction, they give you the same answer all the different days of the week. And there are some some, some others as well. So the two don't give the same answers, but we but they 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 often give similar answers. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out there's no that while I I suggest in practice we might be able to use evaluative measures and eudaimonic measures if we had them uh, to tell us what it is that, that increases happiness there doesn't have to be a necessary link there so here's the here's kind of a case imagine we have a miserable saint um, who is uh, works very hard and made himself tremendously unhappy but but because the saint is doing God's work he feels like he has an extremely high life satisfaction and that he feels like his life is, is incredibly worthwhile so so this is an individual who would who would um, uh, I mean we could even say that this person feels more satisfied with his life because he's miserable because he thinks that God wants people to be doing mis miserable diligent work so in, in this case there is going to be um, this person will score very low on ha on the happiness measure but will score high on the other two so these things don't have to go together it just so happens that in in lots of cases, they, they go enough together, but they, you know, there's no necessary link there. Okay, so uh, I've said that social scientists do in fact measure subjective well-being, and one of those measures of subjective well-being seems pretty close to, to happiness as, um, as Bentham would have liked it, but we might worry whether these measures are, are really any good. So. Do they, in fact, capture the things that they're interested in? Um, is there any sensible way we can compare um, your happiness scores to mine? So there's a, there's a long history in economics of suspicion 
of the, um, the possibility or the, even the need to, uh, to measure happiness. So this is a, uh, a long quote which I'll read out from, from Richard Layard, who's an economist who, who has been pioneering and advocating for the, uh, the measurement of happiness and, and the using of those scores to guide public policy in the UK. In the 18th century, Bentham and others proposed that the object of public policy should be maximised the sum of happiness in society. So economics evolved as a study of utility or happiness, which was assumed to be in principle measurable and comparable across people. It was also assumed that the marginal utility of income was higher for poor people than for rich people, so that income ought to be redistributed unless the efficiency cost was too high. All of these assumptions were significantly challenged by Lionel Robbins in his famous book on the nature and significance of economic science, published in 1932. Robbins argued correctly that if you want to predict a person's behaviour, you need only assume he has a stable set of preferences. His levels of happiness need not be measurable, nor comparable to other people. Moreover, economics was, as Robbins put it, about the relationship between the given ends and scarce means, and how the ends or preferences came to be formed was outside its scope. So there was this sort of, um, uh, this, this move in the, in, the 19, uh, in the 1930s that if economics was going to be a serious science, it needed to be looking at objective stuff. So the idea of looking at what was inside people's heads was not really a sort of a scientific endeavour. It wasn't something that you could measure or understand, and there was no need to do it anyway because all economics was about was about um, understanding how people went about uh, maximising their preferences. And you didn't need to see inside people's heads to see their, to see their preferences. But the, uh, the pendulum seems to have uh, swung on this, and there's now an increasing interest in using uh, there's now an increasing interest in using um, subjective well-being measures to try and understand what is going on in people's lives. Um, and so I'm going to first I'm going to talk about uh, 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 the, the the measurability um, of these measures, whether they whether they succeed in in capturing the thing they're interested in, and then we're going to then we're going to look at interpersonal comparisons. Okay, so if we want to compare, uh, if, if we if we want to compare uh, one person's happiness scores to another, what we what we need is the existence of an epistemic access to a numerical scale that allows comparisons of all well-being states across and within person and the distances between those states. So that's the desiderata. That's the thing that, that that's the thing that we we really need. We need a scale which we can use uh, to measure the uh, to measure the the well-being of uh, any two different people and know what the differences are. So um, if we want to measure distance, we want, our, you know, we want, to, we want a, a tape measure which we can use, which, which will be, gives us um, a uniform understanding of distances in, in different times and places. So there's, a, there's kind of a few, a few like, different bits within achieving measurability that we're after. So one, is, so one uh, concept is, is validity. So does the measure capture the underlying concept it purports to measure? So does the does the thick so in the case of uh, in the case of uh, happiness, um, and this will also apply to life satisfaction, but this would apply to other sort of uh, psychometric um, psychometric measurement, such as if we're looking at intelligence or personality. The idea is that there's we, we think there is really this thing, so IQ or happiness, and the question is, do we uh, can we can we get at it with our measures? And uh, one way to and one, one one way to test this is to see if it behaves in the way we we would theoretically expect it to if we were really measuring the thing we wanted to measure. The other bit is reliability. So does the measure give consistent results in identical circumstances? So here's a uh, here's my uh, example. Imagine um, I tell you that I'm going to use bathroom scales to measure your height. Or let's say I'm going to use this to measure the uh, to measure the height of children. Okay, uh, so let's start off by by saying I have some some uh, some bathroom scales which give me a totally random result. So a bunch of children step on it and they just give random numbers. Okay, the scale isn't reliable. Okay, but let's say I replace my random scale with a uh, with a <coughs> just a, a normal functioning bathroom scale. Okay, so then my the children are uh, are getting on my on my scales. Um, and uh, and so uh, taller children tend to be heavier. So it looks like it looks like I'm capturing something important here. It looks like my scales are telling me something about height. But just it's it's fairly obvious that this is not a that it's not a measure of height we've got with the scales. It's a measure of weight. Um, and so validity is so to assess validity is not just to 
look at the statistics, we actually have to you know, put our thinking hats on and think, well, is this, is this working in the, in the way it wants it to, in, in the way that we, the, we would want it to? Okay, so let's look at these little bits in turn. So um, our subjective well-being uh, measures reliable, and reliability is sort of a, a lower bar. If, uh, if um, uh, reliability is, is the sort of the signal to noise ratio, so if my bathroom scales give a random number, then you know, even if they were really measuring, they would be um, uh, they would be a measure of uh, of my weight, but they would just be unreliable. So so they wouldn't in fact be. I wouldn't be succeeding in, in measuring the, the underlying concept. Um, so uh, it's actually, uh, so what, what one test for this is test, retest reliability. So if you measure the same people um, uh, at different times, so they give you the same result. And um, so studies uh, have found that there is reliability. I'm quoting the, this is from the OECD, which um, has done a, a large report on this. So the correlation is between a 0.5 and 0.7 for evaluative and experience measures over a two-week period, and 0.65 for life satisfaction over a one- and two-year period. So those numbers um, uh, may not mean very much to you, and I'm not sure they necessarily mean very much to, to, to me. But the way this is uh, the way this, this is approached is that there are, uh, is that we're looking at is that is the question is are these measures good enough? So we're going to expect there to be some change. So we wouldn't expect there to be perfect reliability not least because we expect people's lives to be changing over time. But these are, are good enough that, um, by the, kind of the accepted uh, standards that we think that, that we are already kind of continuing to capture the, the underlying phenomenon. Uh, and again, if uh, every time you asked me 0 to 10 how satisfied I was, was I with my life, I gave you a different answer, then clearly you know, I, um, that the measure would not be reliable and it would be getting at the underlying thing, unless my moods were, in fact, fluctuating so randomly. Um, the other kind of test you can do, which actually I, I haven't mentioned here, is if you've got different, if, you've, if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to measure the same cons construct in different ways, so let's say you've got, a, you've got like 10 different, slightly different ways of asking someone how satisfied are they with their life, then if those answers have high correlation, then you might think you're capturing the, uh, the same concept. Okay, are the measures valid? So there are, there, are, there are sort of three different ways we can think about validity. And really the, really the test here is, is um, do we, is the, is the information we're getting from having measured this thing, is it working the way we expect it to on the basis of our theoretical understanding of the concept? So because um, happiness and indeed life satisfaction are subjective concepts, we can't go inside someone's head um, and, and really see what's going on, then we, we have to see if these subjective reports are, uh, are matching the world in the way that um, we think they would. So one test is face validity. So um, do participants judge that the question is an appropriate way to, me to measure the concept of interest? So <clears throat> I hope this is, um, I mean, this is reasonably straightforward. So it seems like if I wanted to find out how sad you were yesterday, a reasonably good question to ask would be, how sad were you yesterday? So the, um, it's, it's kind of intuitive that these questions are, you know, they are getting at the thing we're interested in. So if I asked you, how sad were you yesterday? And I said, ah, oh, that's a measure of your height. Well, it just seems like that's not a measure of your height. And we don't really need to say, say very much more about it. So participants aren't, aren't often um, asked this, but the way you can, but the way it can be, there are a couple of um, statistical ways to check it. So one is to see um, how long people take to answer the questions. Um, and so when you ask people about their life satisfaction, that uh, people, uh, the median time to answer is 30 seconds. So people sort of sit around and think, hey, you know, how's my life going? So what that suggests is that, um, is that this question is, um, that you know, people can't, that, that, that this question doesn't take such a long time to answer that people just don't understand the question. It requires some thinking, but if, you know, if I were to ask you a, a very difficult maths question, you might just not understand what was, you know, you might not give me an answer at all, but it seems like people really do understand the thing they're being asked about. Um, and the way you can test is to see if people, um, how many people fail to answer the question. 
So if people fail to answer the question again, that suggests they don't understand it because it's, it may, might, may, might not be a valid measure. And it turns out that the item response rate for subjective well-being measures is higher than that for income. Um, and it's about the same as things, for, things like uh, educational status, um, employment and relationship status. So people are, you know, people are prepared to tell you, um, are, prepared to, are as prepared to answer questions about their life satisfaction and happiness as they are about whether they're in a relationship and, and unemployed, but more so than, than they are to tell you about their income. So it seems like people, uh, uh, if, you know, if, if this is, has the same sort of response rates as these more kind of conventional economic questions, um, then uh, it seems like that's, that suggests that it is capturing something. Uh, it is perhaps capturing the thing of interest. Second bit is, is convergent validity. So does the measure correlate with other things that we think are measures of the same thing? So Kahneman and Kruger list the following of correlates for both high life satisfaction and happiness. So smiling a lot, smiling with the, with the eyes, the so-called uh, unfakeable smile or the Duchenne smile, um, ratings of one's happiness made by, uh, made by friends, for a frequent verbal expressions of positive emotions, happiness of close relatives, self-reported health. So, what's, so what's, what's happening here is that we, we have our measure of, of, of subjective well-being or our measures of subjective well-being. We're thinking, what other ways could we measure this which are different, but we think are gonna capture the same thing. So how frequently people smile that seems like the kind of thing which is going to have some link. And what we can do at each stage is to test whether, whether these bits are really believable. So if it turned out that, uh, if it turned out that um, people who said, they were very, who said they were very happy in self-report were rated as really unhappy by their friends and they didn't smile, we would think that people's self-reports weren't very good. And we kind of balance these up. We think, well, okay, maybe people just lie all the time when, when you ask them how they feel. And if we want to know how, how happy people are, you know, if this was the way the evidence played out, we should just ask people's friends to make other ratings because those seem like the thing which is getting closer at the other phenomenon of interest than asking individuals themselves. But it looks like so far uh, it's okay. Uh, and the third is construct validity. So does the measure perform or behave as we would expect it to? So while... Um, uh, well, uh, the, the construal validity was about does it does it does it correlate with other proxy measures? This is does it behave in the world? So is it um, do things which we would expect to cause high subjective well-being uh, cause it? And do people with high subjective well-being go on to do other things we would expect them to? Um, and uh, so here's here's some bits of evidence. So. Um, uh, so higher income and being in a wealthier country are associated with higher um, happiness and sat satisfaction. So it's better to be, to be, um, uh, it's better on subjective well-being being measures to be wealthier. And again, I think this is this is what we would expect. Associated with higher life satisfaction, being healthy, social contact, education, being in a stable relationship, being employed. Uh, regarding um, uh, experience measures, intimate relations. Socializing, relaxing, eating and praying are associated with high levels of positive effect. These are the things which people tend to enjoy when they do them. Uh, commuting, working and childcare are associated with low levels of net positive effect. <clears throat> so how surprising is it that people prefer to be um, having sex than commuting? Uh, not very surprising. If it were the other way around, we'd think that our measures were, uh, were getting something wrong. <clears throat> um, and Bereni and I, and I find that effect measures have the same broad set of drivers as life satisfaction, although I've noticed that uh, I've identified earlier that there are some differences. These come apart. That's because uh, how satisfied you are with your life is just not the same question as, uh, as how happy you are. But um, like broadly, the, the, these, things, uh, these things run together, although the relative importance of different bits changes. So I mentioned education, not really relevant for life satisfaction. No, education is relevant for life satisfaction, but not for, uh, not for happiness. But there are some, uh, there are some cases where we, which seem, uh, at least at first glance, really challenging to whether our, our measures are getting at the right thing, or whether they, something's gone wrong. So the, the, possibly the most famous finding or apparent finding in the subjective well-being literature is the Eastland paradox 
which finds that while at any one time richer people are more in a given country are uh, more satisfied than poorer people, and richer countries are more satisfied than poorer countries, as, as um, countries get wealthier over time, aggregate life satisfaction stays relatively unchanged. So this is what we, we see here. This is from um, uh, four developed countries. The, uh, the red line going from bottom left to top right represent um, GDP per head, and the, the dots represent um, uh, average life satisfaction. And so you can see that countries got much wealthier, but they haven't, they, they, they seem not to have got more satisfied. So, one, I think, skeptical way of responding the, to this sort of thing is to say, hold on, we know pre-theoretically, or we know intuitively that richer, that if we all get wealthier, prosperity increases, people will be happier and more satisfied. The measures don't show that, therefore the measures must be getting something wrong, therefore they, they, can't, be, they can't be relied upon. And then there would then, there, there would then be a further question as to, what, as to how we would try and understand which things did in fact increase happiness or, or life satisfaction. But that would be sort of the sceptical reading uh, of the phenomena. And this is how, how sometimes people do see it. Look, the happiness measures, you know, kind of, I'm using happiness measures to refer to all the subjective well-being measures. The subjective well-being measures show that as we, get, as we get richer, we don't get more satisfied. So therefore, they must be wrong. So um, that would be perhaps one way of reading it, although I'll suggest in a moment that's not very satisfactory. But, but even in, but in cases like this, we, I think the, the, the approach is to think, well, where do, the, where do the measures accord to our theoretical view of how they should work and where don't they? Now, if it seems like, if it seems like um, our subjective well-being measures get the right answer, the one we would expect them to get in almost all the circumstances, and they get it wrong in one circumstance, then it seems um, somewhat, uh, somewhat ad hoc to say that they to say, look, they got, it, they got it right here, but they got it wrong here. So we should either say they got it right in general or they got it wrong in general. And when we're deciding whether they got it right in general or they got it wrong in general, it seems like what we ought to do is to weigh up the, is to weigh up the, the, sort of the, the evidence we have. So if we, if we get a couple of weird results, uh, one response is to throw out the measure and say, look, it's not capturing the thing which we, which we want it to capture. Another is to say, oh, look, it turns out that it, that it, that it may in fact um, go that way. Um, okay, so, but it, actually I don't think this, the result of the Eastlin paradox is, uh, is so surprising. Um, so here's a question. Uh, you have two choices. Your yearly income is $50,000 and others earn $25,000, or your yearly income is $100,000 and others earn 200000 Okay, so we're going to have some class participation. Um, uh, who, who would prefer... A, that they have a yearly income of 50,000 and others earn 25,000? Do we have it? Do we, no, no, a one taker? It depends on like how the economy in countries sort of follows. Okay, so we, we're, <laughs> I mean, we're abstracting for, you know, like all, all of the uh, other details. So, um, okay, who chooses option B? Your yearly income is 100,000 and others earn 200,000. Okay, so we've got, we've got more for that. So it turns out when you ask people this question, people strongly prefer A over B, um, even, though, even though you smart people have, have mistakenly chosen B. And uh, what this suggests is that people just intuitively understand the idea of social comparison. So the, the, impact, of, the impact of income on subjective well-being, life satisfaction or happiness, uh, is not just about my own income, it's also about the income of those around me. So if a rising tide raises all ships, then my boat is is no happier than it was before, to mix a few metaphors. So maybe, you know, with a little bit more thinking, these kind of purportedly mysterious, circum uh, mysterious results are maybe not so surprising. Okay. Um, so now we move to something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, uh, more fiddly. Um, so this is the, the question of whether we can compare happiness scores. Uh, we're just going to call them more happiness scores. So is going from a, a 2 to a 3 on a 10-point scale the same for me as it is uh, from you going to a 7 to 8? Is that, is that an equivalent increase in, um, in uh, subjective experience? Um, and we're not concerned here. So we're, just, so we're not concerned here with distribution. So many people think that if we could take someone's happiness from a 
A's happiness from two to three or B's happiness from seven to eight, it would be better overall to, to increase A's happiness because we want to give more weight to the well-being of the worse off. And we're not interested in questions of distribution, we're just looking at uh, how it feels for, um, for individuals. And uh, you know, we, we could talk about questions of, of what the correct distribution is later on. So I'm going to break this. So this is known as the question of interpersonal cardinality. So interpersonal is between individuals. Intra is within a, a single individual. Um, cardinality refers to whether the phenomenon at hand has a quantity, whether it can be measured. Um, so the, the cardinal numbers are one, two, three, four, five, and the ordinal numbers are first, second, third, fourth. So there's no, there's no kind of distance or quantity uh, between the ordinal numbers like there is for the cardinal numbers. So um, a ranking in a race is an ordinal ranking, whereas the, uh, the distance between first, second, third, fourth, and fifth in your 100 meter dash, that's, a, that's cardinal. There's, you know, it has units and a quantity. So, I'm going to break this down into, into different bits. So the first question we can ask is, um, is the thing that we're interested in, happiness or life satisfaction, is it, does it have a cardinal structure or is it merely a ranking? Um, and I'm going to perhaps lazily just appeal to, to intuition here. It just seems obvious that, uh, that both of these things uh, are cardinal. So, uh, so we can ask, does it, does it make sense to say um, X hurt twice as much as Y? Or I, sum to, or I feel 10 times better today, 10 times happier than I did yesterday. So if we think that, uh, if we think that um, happiness is really ordinal, all we could say is this state feels worse than this other one. But we can't say by how much it feels. And it just seems like uh, intuitively, I'm, I'm relying on my own uh, sense data here. It just seems like you know, some, things are, there, some things are better than others. And, we can, uh, and there's, there's kind of a quantity by which we can say that they, say that they um, increase. So if we really thought that uh, happiness was ordinal, um, we would not be able to say things like uh, being thrown into a pit of lava feels 10 times worse than stubbing your toe. We would just be able to say, look, it just feels worse. I can't tell you how much worse. Um, and I think only, a, only an economist would really believe that happiness was ordinal. So it seems like the underlying phenomenon has cardinal structure and the next question is do people's do people when people uh, use scales do they report in a do they report in a um, uh, do they do they report the scale as if it's cardinal is the is the distance equal interval you know, the same the same qualitative experience change between a two and a three and a three and a four and a five and a six okay so a worry here is that individuals could interpret subjective well-being scales as logarithmic like the Richter scale um, so the Richter scale for earthquakes going from a two to three um, has sorry, going from going from a two to three compared to a three to four. In the latter case, you've got ten times the amount of uh, energy that's being released. So even though there's just you know, a one unit difference on the scale, the different the, the the distances between these um, units are are not the same. There's a ten times difference between uh, the latter and the former. So. Uh, one thing people sometimes suggest is that happiness might function a bit like sound, where it takes twice as much of an increase in, um, uh, in kind of the physical movement of particles to bring about the same increase in perceived uh, loudness. Uh, it's the professional Weber law. And this, it turns out that this is, this is in fact how people experience uh, sound and also things like, um, like if you give people rocks to hold, you've got to double the rock before it feels like the, the increase in um, perceived heaviness is uh, uh, increased by a, a regular amount. Um, so um, I think that there's one sense in which this analogy which people appeal to is not really apt. So I don't think it makes sense to say it makes twice as much of an increase in happiness to cause the same increase in perceived happiness. So if we're imagining this as a graph, we've just got the you know, x-axis and the y-axis are the same. Both of them are perceived happiness. So it's sort of odd to think that one of them would have different scaling from another. Um, and in the sound analogy, what we've got is we've got an objective measure, so you know, vibration, and then we've got a subjective one, which is perceived loudness. And, like, and that makes sense. Um, so imagine that we were measuring people's brains and we thought, and we, you know, we, we noticed that um, twice as much of a vibration of a certain kind in the brain led to the same uh, perceived increase in happiness. 
okay, well then that might be, so, so that, that, that might well be the case. Um, but then the, you know, the units on the happiness reporting scale would still be, would still, would still um, the difference between a, the, the two units would still be, uh, the, have the same qualitative experience, would be, have the same qualitative experience, even though the objective phenomena might have to double to cause the same, the same, the same change. Um, so that's just kind of a quibbling with the analogy. Um, but then looking at experimental evidence, uh, it just suggests that uh, people do treat scales as equal intervals. So if you give people a number of, uh, if you give people a number of different points, they assume that the, dif the distance between them is, um, uh, is the same. Um, although I have I have some yeah I have some concerns about about the um, about the evidence here, but it seems like broadly people treat scales as equal interval. Okay, so first bit was, is the underlying phenomenon cardinal? Second bit was, uh, do people use, use their scales in a, in a cardinal way or, or, or not? So that gets us intra-personal cardinality. And the final question is inter-personal uh, cardinality. So you know, we're both using our, our measuring sticks in, this, in, you know, in the same way, but are, they, are, are, us, um, are we using the same kind of sticks or are we using them the same, um, in the same manner? So I think we can split out two concerns here. Um, one is that individuals could correctly report where they are between the minimum and maximum points of their scales, but have different capacities for happiness. So let's say I ask you, you know, what percentage of your, you know, how happy do you feel? And you say, I feel 70% of my maximum happiness. Okay, and then maybe uh, I ask someone else and they, they say, oh, I feel 70% of my maximum happiness. But maybe the second person is a utility monster. They just experience 10,000 times more happiness than the former. So, what, so all we have on our scales is we have maximum and minimum points. Um, it doesn't seem like there's any, really any other way to set up the scales because there's no kind of common unit of happiness we could say is the same for everyone. So we just have a minimum and a maximum, but people's minimum, minimum and maximum might be different. So that's one concern. Another concern would be that people have the same minimum and maximum capacities, but they happen to use the scales differently. So um, uh, maybe, you know, uh, me going from a two to three is uh, is just you know twice as big a difference as, as you going from a, a five to a six because uh, I've just ha just the nature of the way I use my scales. So I've got the same uh, we've got the same minimum and maximum. We're just kind of you know maybe I'm using this bit and you're using that bit. Or all right, it would actually be the other way around. So if we kind of for consistency, we might say that in the latter case, people are sort of language monsters rather than utility monsters. They've got the same experiences, but they're just using their, their, their scales in different ways. Okay, so a, a, few, uh, a few replies here and why this might not be as much of a problem as it seems. So kind of a, a, a general reply is that, um, is that maybe, we, we, maybe we have serious doubts about um, if we're saying how happy we feel on our, on our scales. Between two individuals, we could be getting it wrong. But we might think that in large numbers, these sort of differences will wash out as noise. So if there's just as many people who have you know, this, many people have slightly higher capacities and at the same number who have slightly lower capacities than the average and report you know have a slightly use slightly more of their scale versus slightly less of their scale over large numbers these things are going to uh, they're going to they're going to it seems like they're going to wash out um, so by analogy if you had one bad thermometer a thermometer you know is is inaccurate or somewhat inaccurate um, uh, you might not have very much confidence as to whether the Antarctic was hotter than the uh, than the Sahara, but if you had lots of these uh, and you knew that they had different degrees of inaccuracy, but you knew their inaccuracy was was just uh, distributed in some uh, in some random way, then uh, you'd expect, okay, well, if we know that the that all of the scales, um, uh, like on average, the thermometers show lower scores in the Antarctic than the Sahara, we might think, well, we don't trust the individual readings, but we but we're prepared to accept this will work uh, overall. Um, a sort of a, another general re reply, which we might hope solve all of these questions, is whether we could measure brain waves or whether we could use some other sort of objective phenomena to check. Um, but the problem is that uh, is that any objective measure we would use is necessarily parasitic on believing that the subjective measures are are trustworthy. So let's say um, 
uh, one thing which is sometimes suggested is like, look, no, we can't trust people's answers. Let's, let's not ask people, let's measure their cortisol. So cortisol is a hormone that's supposed to be related to stress. So let's say you stick a needle in my arm and you find out, oh, I've got more cortisol. Well, is that, is cortisol associated with, happy, with being happy or less happy? Well, uh, how are you gonna find out? I mean, the, you could ask me, okay, uh, but let's say you don't trust people's self-report, so you can't, you can't ask me. So how do you know if, if, if high cortisol is associated with happiness or low cortisol? Well, you don't. I mean, maybe you want to look at, say, whether people who have a high cortisol smile uh, more than those with low cortisol. But how do you know that smiling is associated with happiness? Well, again, you might have to ask someone. So, um, so the sceptical reply, you know, let's look at objective measures, uh, it doesn't really get off the ground. You, you need, you know, if you don't trust subjective measures at all, there's nothing you can tether them to to, to help answer the question. And so, with brain waves, let's say, um, uh, let, let's say we discover there is, uh, let's say we, we see that there's some amount of brain functioning in A, and then there's B has twice as much of it, and then B reports, you know, twice as much happiness as A. Um, well, we don't, we don't know what the relationship is between the objective and the subjective. We don't see that. We just have to assume it. So we can't derive these things just from the objective measures. We have to make some assumptions. So I think that one doesn't help so much. So a reply to kind of one specific, the, the first concern specifically, uh, could we have different capacities? It seems somewhat unparsimonious to assume that there really are utility monsters. So, I mean, maybe there are some differences, but it just looks like I mean, how, like, how much difference are we really going to expect given we've got the same brains, uh, we live in the same societies, and so on? It would just be really remarkable, um, you know, have some, some particular thing that, that, that we would expect these differences. And sometimes we'd be, we'd be able to pick them up. So there are people who have kind of congenital dif uh, immunity to pain, um, and we can kind of tell from, we think we can tell from, that, from these people's behavior that they really don't experience pain. Um, but in kind of, ordinary circumstances it just seems a bit mysterious to say that there's, that there's going to be these large differences um, so this won't help us all the way uh, so uh, many people think that, that animals have lower capacities for, for happiness than humans um, and that if we let's say we genetically engineered humans we might have a bit of a problem with our scale so we create some new humans and uh, we think we've done some stuff in their brains to give them like a much greater capacity for bliss and then they say they're 70% happy, and I say I'm 70% happy. Uh, we think there's going to be some difference there. We just don't know what it is, and it's not it's not clear. There's any way of there's any way of really establishing this, um, except by uh, assumption. Uh, maybe there is. I'm, I'm I can't think what it would be. So that's going to help us with kind of ordinary circumstances. It's not going to help us with um, with other ones that we're interested in. Um, so reply to two, the concern that people might have the same uh, capacities but use lang but, but um, uh, use the skills in different ways. So the thought here is that we, this is that we seem to regulate each other's language use. So let's say I, I um, uh, you ask me how I feel and I say, oh, I've stubbed my toe. I've had an agonising day of pain, and you say, well, hold on, that's like that's not a that's not a terrible day. That's a mildly annoying day. It's just, you know. You shouldn't be like you don't call it a terrible day it's like it was just wasn't really that bad at all so if language is going to be this kind of goes back to, to wittgenstein if language is going to have meaning we, there has to be a, a shared context of use uh, we need to understand what each other say and so it seems like we so this is kind of a hypothesis i don't i haven't like looked at the evidence for this but i would expect this is going to be true and it might be uh, worth looking at that we because we regulate each other's language use we're going to use words in in similar kinds of ways so that uh, uh, you know, we we see the we see the football striker, you know, it's scoring the goal, and you know, we think, oh, like that's maximum happiness, and then we kind of compare ourselves on the basis of of these things, so language and observation. Um, so the concern here is that different language groups might use the scales differently. Um, so uh, maybe the Americans and the English uh, have uh, have very different standards. So even though they kind of correct each other within their own communities, maybe they, there's, there's a difference. Um, and it seems like just as an empirical fact of the matter, it doesn't seem like this is really that true. So this is a very interesting new study by Heliwell and Al. They looked at uh, immigrants moving from 100 different countries to Canada, and they found that regardless of their country of origin, 
origin, origin, the average levels and distribution of life satisfaction among immigrants mimic those of Canadians. So you've got people coming from all different parts of the world, you know, different kind of language groups and cultural groups and all this sort of stuff, um, and they end up having basically the same scores as the, as the Canadians. So that suggests that, um, according to Halliwell, and it seems right to me, that, that uh, life satisfaction reports are primarily driven by circumstances rather than language use. So if there were really language differences and cultural differences, you'd expect these to show up, uh, but they don't. And you know, perhaps it's not so surprising to think that humans all around the world are roughly aware of what you know, other lives people live, and they're able to kind of judge these in this partially global way. Um, but their concern would be, what if certain life events change how sort of, uh, what, what if uh, uh, there are particular life events which change how people use their scales um, so that even within a particular language group, we're still going to get we're still going to get differences. So uh, the challenge here is. So let me here, here to just show you a picture. Um, so one thing which people sometimes think is that uh, is that people adapt to disability. So people become disabled, and then after a while, they refer to refer to their hedonic set point. And what this shows is that people are in fact. Well, there are two explanations here. So one is that people really do return to their hedonic set, set point, and they, you know, they, they, they've, these bad life events have stopped being bad. Another is that they, these life events continue to be bad; they just change their standard. Um, so the scales have renormed, but it seems like um, as it just seems like in in fact this doesn't happen. So this is um, a time series looking at uh, non-adaptation to disability from a couple of different countries. So you can see zero is the point where the person becomes disabled, and then it follows the, for up to four years afterwards. And interestingly, there's some anticipation effects. So people see that they're about, you know, life starts to go wrong. Um, yeah, but what we can see is that people don't seem to get used to being, uh, uh, to being disabled. And if it were really the case that people just, um, just changed, their, changed all of their standards, um, then we would expect people to, you know, all life events, we would expect people to just end up at their hedonic set point, but it seems like that's um, it seems like that's not the case. So, because there's differential evidence on uh, adaptation, people adapt to some things and not to others. That suggests if if people have changed their language use, their sort of their scale use, then we expect to see dis uh, adaptation adaptation to everything, and we don't. And that suggests that people do adapt to the things they say they adapt to, and they don't adapt to those that they don't. Okay. So that's, uh, that's my, my time. I'm just going to sum up. So uh, the, first, the first part of the lecture was looking at different, uh, was looking at the relationship between happiness and well-being. I'm just trying to clarify some terms. Uh, I tried to argue that whatever your views, there's going to be some role in your moral theory for, for the importance of, of increasing happiness, at least when that's not too demanding. You don't have to violate constraints. And then we, we looked at the measurability of uh, we looked at the measurability of happiness, and I explained. Uh, and I, I uh, suggested possibly a more hopeful vision than the, than the one which um, possessed 1930s economists. Okay, uh, thank you very much. If you would like to go, you are free to do so. But if you have questions, feel free to stick around. Do some research into it, but there's, this sort of tend to be between about 10 and 30 quid. Um, I think that may also help in music. Uh, do they have one of those in the DAA? There's, there's no sort of passive microphone system, it's the radio mics or nothing. No. <laughs> it's the short answer. Um, something to discuss at the IT and digital resources. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all we've done. So we're just going to leave the cabling like that? No, I don't take it out. Um, but that, as you can see, it's a bit of a manual process setting up and thing. That AV presentation yesterday, they, they had um, a previous one by Panasonic uh, for PTZ um, cameras. And I was hoping to look at getting one put at the back there that we could just uh, always have in situ. But... Uh, they said, oh yeah, we've got one you can borrow in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got one you can borrow in and then it kind of comes out. So. Yeah.
I mean, they're about two grand or something, but if it sort of enables us to just remotely record by the push of a button rather than having to do this malarkey, then it's well worth it, I think. Um, I just thought I'd show you just in case you're asked to pop down and, and, and set up a video recording. It, it's literally just adding that webcam into the equation and, um, and then firing up WebLearn and, and just making sure that you can, you know, it, it's framed okay. But what we'll do is the next one that comes around, I'll, uh, you know, um, come down with you and yeah, help you sure, out rather sure. than leave you to struggle. I've also left a, a USB stick there because there's, there's the times when they need to transfer something from a laptop to oh, here. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So I store there with a USB stick around. Well, I tend to keep these upstairs.